anthropology class in school one time. I was reading about a tribe in Borneo. And one of the attitudes of the tribe was if someone was sick, you didn't joke about it because there was something you could do about the illness. It was something very serious. But once the person had died, at the funeral there, there was a lot of choking. The idea being that death was something you couldn't prevent. Once it had happened, you had just had to accept the fact. And at that point you could choke about it. Of course, the joking around death is kind of a nervous laughter, because there still is that fear of death. It can, it's going to come. We don't know when. And we didn't realize that we signed on for it when we signed on for this life. But there it was, there it is in the fine print. But it's not that we can't do anything about it. The quality of how you die and the attitude that you take toward death beforehand, that's something you can work on. This is one of the reasons why we meditate. It's the best way to get your mind ready. both in terms of your attitude toward death beforehand and in the skills you're going to need when you die. These are precisely the skills we develop as we meditate. You focus your mind. You try to keep it focused on one thing. You try to get the mind past its attraction for sensual desires. Spread goodwill to all beings. And you try to find something of real value inside. All too often you hear that the Buddha said everything is changing, everything is impermanent. We didn't say that about nirvana. There is this dimension that can be touched at the mind, right where you're experiencing your body right now. In fact, sometimes they call it seeing with the body. And it is something of true value and is not touched by time, and, but you can touch it. And it becomes part of the mind's range. And that's when you're safe. It's knowing that there is this dimension that can be touched in the mind that doesn't die. You want to have if you're going to have a direct experience of that, so much the better. But even if you haven't had direct experience of it, you can take it on the Buddha's word and the word of all the greater chants, that there really is something there, something that doesn't die. That's what we're looking for as we meditate. And as we approach death, we realize that we don't have to fear it quite so much. But there still is that tendency of the mind to go back to its sensual pleasures or to go back to ill will for this person or that person. And you've got to put those things aside. You have to work on those things. This is one of the reasons why we meditate not only on the breath. We have the contemplation of the body and the contemplation of sensual desires in general. This fascination that the mind has with thinking about sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. You want to see that it's a blight on the mind. There are better things to aim for. That sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on sensory. Sensory input it can be totally there within the mind, simply by the way you inhabit the body from within. Or as the mind gets into more refined states of concentration, you can tune into a sense of space inside, a sense of just simple knowing inside, or a sense of nothingness inside. Not a scary nothingness of annihilation, but just a sense that there's nothing impinging on the mind at all to cause it any, any disturbance. As you get skilled at these things, then you have a way of lifting your mind above its concern for sensual pleasures. Because as the Buddha pointed out, that's one of the things that leads to fear of death, is fear that you're going to lose your body, fear that you're going to lose the sensual pleasures as you've enjoyed as a human being. And if we develop the skills in meditation so that you know you have something else beside those things, it's not so scary. 
we work on goodwill because we want to make sure that we don't do anything cruel or harmful to anybody else. Because that too is a cause for fear of death, the fear that there may be a punishment waiting for us on the other side. So if you can look at your behavior and see that you didn't do anything to harm anybody, that gives you some security. But the real security comes when you know that you've actually seen the Dharma inside. You have no doubts about it. So again, it keeps coming back to the meditation is the only way you're going to get past your fear of death. And this is something that each of us has to do for ourselves. No one else can do it for us. Which is why, as you go through life, is you've got to keep this priority in mind. There'll come a point where even the best doctors in the world can't keep you alive. And all your loved ones around you, no matter how much they love you, they can't do anything for you at that point. You're the only one who can do anything for yourself then. It's the choices you make at that point, your ability to focus the mind to keep it from wandering off into thoughts that will lead to, to sorrow or despair or fear. That's something you'll have to do for yourself. And although we don't like to think about death, but that is one of the strange things about human beings is we all know we're going to die, but we don't want to think about it, thinking that somehow by not thinking about it it's going to keep it at bay. But I've never seen any case where someone was able to prevent death by not thinking about it. You want to be able to prepare. Sit down with yourself and give yourself a good talk. Ask yourself, are you ready to go? If not, what are you still latching on to? What are you still holding on to? That you see as of worth. That would drag you down at the, when the time came to go. Okay, you've got to work on that attachment. See that regardless of the pleasure it may give, in the short term, in the long term, it's going to cause a lot of trouble. Again, this is a purely inner affair. But the problem is, as we live in this world, we let outside affairs come in and crowd our inner affairs out. This duty becomes pressing, that person's desire for this, that becomes pressing. And they press our own true well-being and flat against the wall, so it doesn't have any time or space. This too is where you have to talk to yourself. That passes we chanted just now about right effort, generating desire to abandon what is unskillful, generating desire to develop what is skillful. The generating desire is your own motivation, basically. It's the desire that makes you want to practice, to realize that this is something we're doing voluntarily. No one's forcing the practice on us, which may be one of the reasons why it's always pushed in the back. It's like the line of thinking they say when they charge for meditation courses. They said, if we gave the course for free, people might sign up, but then it wouldn't come. They'd feel very casual about not coming. And the problem is there is some truth to that. We don't charge here, but I have seen places where they charge and that's how they justify it, that people don't take it seriously unless you charge for it. We don't have to pay for the practice, and maybe that might be one of the reasons why people tend to put it aside. They didn't invest any money. But you've got to realize you've got your well-being invested in the practice. So learn how to generate some desire to practice and heedfulness, you know, contemplation of the fact that death is going to come and there is something you can do about whether you're going to die well or die poorly. That is one of the prime motivators for the practice. Other ways of motivating yourself are a sense of shame, a healthy sense of shame, where you realize you've got something good here, you've got a good skill that you're working on. And it'd be a shame that you just left it aside, not let it slide. 
Another good motivation is compassion, realizing that you will benefit as you go through life if you've been able to master these skills. And when the time comes to die, you're not the only one that's going to benefit. You'll be less of a burden on the people around you. If you've got your mind under your control, you won't be thrashing around. And people will be a lot less worried about you, less, a lot less worried for your sake. So there are lots of ways you can motivate yourself, and this is simply something you've got to do. Every morning when you get up, ask yourself, what can I do to make myself want to practice today? Because this depends on each person's psychology. And if you haven't figured out how to make yourself want to practice, okay, that's something you've got to work on. You don't know yourself well enough. How do you get yourself to do things that require a little extra effort, a little extra time. Well, apply those skills to the meditation. Apply those skills to all the practice. There's no other person who can do this for you, so you're the only one who's got to do it for yourself. There's no one who's holding a whip over you to force you. But the fact that aging, illness, and death are there, they hold the whip. It's simply that we keep putting them out of our minds, out of our minds, out of our minds. And then the problem is you go out of your mind when they do come. So as the Buddha said, it's good to reflect on death at least once a day. He actually said if it's only once a day, even that much is heedlessness. But it's better than not reflecting at all. And ask yourself, what can I do to make myself want to do the practice and find the time to do the practice that is going to be for my well-being and is covering an area of my responsibility that nobody else can do for me. If you don't do this, then the practice just begins to slide. But if you can maintain your motivation, you're on the path. And some people complain that it's a, a long path, but it's a lot shorter than the path of being off the path. That kind of path just goes on and on and on forever and never reaches anything of any real value. The Buddhist path, even though it may be long, does arrive at a goal better than which there is nothing. a goal that will never change. It is deathless, because it stands outside of space and time entirely. And once you've tasted that, then you realize there's no need to fear death. The only thing that you want to fear is your own lack of skill. And that's something you can work on. Death may be inevitable, but lack of skill is not, and therein lies hope. <laughs>